The recording for this meeting has begun. Welcome everyone to this Microlinks webinar. I'm Kristen O'Planik from USA's Bureau for Economic Growth, Education, and Environment. Today we'll be sharing insights on adaptive management and practice from a market systems application in Bangladesh. This webinar discusses the practical adaptations and operational and technical approaches implemented by USAID's agricultural value change activity in Bangladesh to support the application of market systems facilitation. As we get started, I'd like to give a special shout out to my colleague, Anna Ruta Roy, who manages AVC with the USAID Bangladesh, within the USAID Bangladesh mission. An exciting evolution of this activity was the joint management process between AVC and the mission staff. And so they all deserve some great kudos for that. We're going to learn a lot from them. Today we will explore highlights from a forthcoming case study. I think we're going to be posting it shortly. And Margie said it is posted um, already. So you'll be able to access that pretty much right away. And we will also share it in the, the post-event resources. But this case study chronicles the adaptive management tactics used by ABC to shift from a linear value chain approach to an inclusive market systems approach. The hope is to demystify what this means and provide some practical suggestions on facilitation and adaptive management. This has important learning for all market facilitation practice, regardless of sector, but especially for Feed the Future. As Feed the Future evolves under the global food security strategy, we'll see systems facilitation approaches gain more prominence. Given finite resources, the new strategy encourages more collaboration and facilitation of private sector engagement rather than direct financing of beneficiaries. So USAID and its implementing partners need to be in the business of partnering and leveraging others to catalyze systemic change and productivity growth. This kind of partnership and leverage means that our implementing partners do not become market actors themselves, but rather facilitate the work of others to make markets work better and you just can't facilitate without adaptive management. Bear in mind that today's webinar is just a taste of the story found in the full case document. And at the end of today's session, we will have a poll question to see if you'd like us to bring Mike and Margie back to do a deeper dive on particular topics. So be looking for that as we wrap up. And if you have to exit early, I think Mar Margie noted in the chat, please go ahead and put in the chat box if there's something you would like to know more about, and we'll see what we can do. As we go along, please type your questions into the chat box as you think of them. We may be able to answer some along the way, and we'll collect them for some dedicated Q&A in the latter half of our time together. Now, I'll briefly introduce our speakers. Margie Brand is the founder and director of EcoVentures International, an organization specializing in learning and behavior change relating to sustainable market systems development. Margie has developed market systems development, value chain, enterprise, microfinance, entrepreneurship, and workforce development curricula and tools that have been translated into over 15 languages and used in over 35 countries. Mike Field has over 25 years of designing, assessing, implementing, and training on leading edge private sector development and enabling environment approaches. He is currently leading USAID's ABC project in Bangladesh. Other recent experience includes designing, advising, and training staff in Kenya, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe on applying systems concepts to private sector and enabling environment challenges. OK, over to you, Margie. Thank you, Kristen. And with that introduction, we sound way too old. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm excited to talk about um, this case study. Um, we have been um, closely following um, some of the adaptations and changes that have taken place with the um, Agricultural Value Chains Project in Bangladesh. And it was exciting for me to be part of writing this case study and researching it because I was also at the same time involved in um, working with some of the staff in Bangladesh. So I was able to learn with them um, as they were testing new interventions and, and trying new approaches. So um, that was really exciting. Um, today we'll be talking a little bit about the, um, you know, what the, the agricultural value chain activity is about, but we're not going to focus on um, digging very deep into many of the technical approaches. We're going to speak about what were some of the changes that took place when the project started in 2013, and the first two years um, had much more of a, a direct um, uh, approach, um, working with uh, training, um, 
uh, training farmers, um, giving grants to NGOs, um, and a lot of support to achieve sort of production improvements. But after um, the first two years, the project, um, with support from the mission, uh, sort of moved to more of a market systems approach. And, um, and so we're going to focus on what were some of the adaptations that took place to support that. And we'll talk through what were the adaptations at the um, a few of the, the adaptations at the intervention design level, but a lot of our adaptations in the management of staff, in the operational management, in the monitoring and evaluation, um, and, and those areas, and what are some of the critic critical success factors to make those um, work well. Um, so a little bit on the screen. I'm not going to read everything that's on the screen each time. That's a lot also joining us um, with background info. Um, but a bit on the agricultural value chain activity, a five-year project um, with the objective to improve food security uh, in Bangladesh. <clears throat> now, very importantly, the project, um, the, the overall uh, sort of objective of the project is um, to support, you know, or impact at least 200,000 farmers in the southern Delta region. Um, of Bangladesh, and we'll talk a little bit about how some of these results have been achieved from a um, market systems uh, perspective. So I think m most importantly, there's always this discussion, it seems, um, at program level and, and even at proposal writing level is, you know, what is this difference between the value chain approach and the market systems approach, and what does a move mean? And I think really critical what we saw um, in studying this project is that rather than dismissing a value chain approach, the project shifted to market systems approach but continues to build from um, a value chain approach. And so, you know, it's really looking at from a market systems approach understanding within the value chains that it's focusing on, um, you know, what are some of the underlying reasons, the incentives, the biases for how and why businesses, people, and the networks have not adapted to come up with solutions themselves. And really that understanding and um, understanding those reasons, understanding those biases, and working within that space um, has been a, a really important part of um, what the project is focusing on. Um, the, just as an aside, the eight value chains are potatoes, tomatoes, mangoes, groundnuts, pulses, which are lentils and mung beans, and then an array of um, various summer vegetables. So it's really a, um, a sort of an agricultural focused initiative, um, obviously, because it's funded through Feed the Future as well. The, um, one of the key adaptations um, was the adaptation in the analysis that was done at the start of the project. Um, and, you know, obviously building on um, sort of basic value chain analysis um, and then leading to market systems analysis. And I'm going to um, turn to Mike Field yeah, in a moment um, to ask Mike to explore a little bit, you know, um, around what were some of the the, the reasons these various analyses were performed. Because, Mike, when we studied this project, we realized that AVC still required basic benchmarking analysis for each value chain function um, to look at what were the performance gaps within those value chains. Um, and it seemed like that was a really critical step. But then an important part was to do market systems analysis to try and understand some of these other um, areas. And, Mike, so I'm wondering if you can talk um, briefly about what were some of the, um, the findings that came um, from the market systems analyses, um, or why was this a really important next step um, to undertake in understanding how to um, strengthen the market system more? Thanks, Margie, and, and hello, everybody. Uh, let me just uh, uh, identify two. We did quite a few, but let me just identify two studies or analyses that we did that were in addition to the kind of value chain analysis. Uh, one we called a good disputes landscape analysis that was kind of a combination of looking at disputes, but also looking at governance patterns uh, around transactions, mostly between farmers and uh, the series of traders that led to the terminal markets of which the far, most of the crop goes through. Uh, what we identified in that was really looking at the social, cultural, and political incentives, uh, biases that shaped a lot of the way market actors interacted. So uh, first we looked at uh, disputes, and in the disputes we saw that there was a lot of unhappiness in transactions, but not a lot of what we called hot disputes. 
uh, meaning that uh, the disputes were raised to the part of going to a, a, a some kind of legal adjudication. So most of the disputes were handled by local um, mediators or local elders. <clears throat> Often the local elder, though, was closely associated to the hierarchy related more to the traders. So in many cases, when we were talking about it, it seemed like the farmers weren't well represented in any kind of mediation of disputes. But the farmers accepted it because we realized there was a strong hierarchy component to how uh, disputes and discussions was being held, which wasn't really related to markets, but related to social cultural dynamics. And that gave us a lot of insight into some of the challenge we had, we we're having of trying to get traders and farmers to work together on a more even basis. Uh, it provided some other incentives to understand why uh, farmers and others wouldn't engage in conversations with people they thought were higher than them. And even later, we realized that this had to do with uh, traders who wouldn't engage or actively seek markets outside of the, their more narrowly defined network because of their perception that, you know, when they're placed in the hierarchy, they couldn't really reach up to a, another level or two in, in their perception of hierarchy. Another one that was quite helpful to us was looking at this thing called mental models. Uh, we used a, a specialized analytical tool to try to assess the mental models of farmers when they were acting as consumers, to try and understand what was what was the sources of information, what was the the kind of lenses or frameworks they had in their head when they were taking information. What we could tell from that was that uh, retailers were by far this uh, were the next in line after farmers, you'd say, in terms of trusted sources of information. They did not trust extension officers very much. They didn't really trust information coming from media or other sources like that. So we realized that when we were working with commercial firms, we had to focus in on marketing and sales strategies and branding strategies that created word of mouth. So that informed quite well a number of uh, marketing tactics like referral systems, referral structures, referral bonus programs as well as loyalty programs that essentially uh, fostered more uh, word of mouth. And those were two of the things that we used that were on top of the value chain analysis that got us more into the, the perceptions of incentives and biases. Great. Thank you, Mike. Those are really two very useful examples and, and so many interesting things um, done through that research. The, you know, I think that what we continually saw with this case is that the, the project really focused on the biases, the incentives, sort of this continually looking at what was, what was driving behavior and how to influence and, um, and, and work within that behavior change space. And so, you know, I think one of the key things that the, the project staff speak about the whole time is trying to understand how, rather than to fix technical um, issues is how do you change biases and incentives in that system? And um, I think that the, the, that focus um, was a key um, component in not necessarily doing direct farmer trainings and interventions and grant giving, but focusing to work with other market actors. So Mike, I was wondering if you could give an example of technical fixes um, that would still be useful to fix, but then how you can also move to changing some of the biases and incentives within the system. And Mike, we can't hear you at the moment. Um, I think we've lost our sound, Mike. Can anybody hear me now? Now we can hear you, Mike. Okay, great. So let me, can I understand a little bit where your question is? Sure, and there's a lot of feedback. I'm not sure where that's coming from. So I was just talking about the, you know, focusing on biases and incentives um, rather than technical fixes. And if there's still a place for technical fixes or whether, um, uh, you know, what, what kind of technical fixes are important to look at and then what kind of biases and incentives were, were useful to look at, just an example of each. Sure, so when we look at technical fixes, well, we're not saying they're, on, they're not important. We're, we're trying to say 
how technical fixes come about is important. So if there's a technical fix in, in terms of a farmer needing a, a new uh, variety of seed uh, in groundnut, for example, which is a challenge we had, and that the, the way the policy worked in Bangladesh, it was defined as an, an oil seed. So, you know, the policy said you, any poli political research or politically funded or publicly funded research had to increase oil in seeds. But the, the commercial um, sector wanted low oil groundnuts for uh, uh, snacks and things like that. So there is no local variety of groundnut seed that was viable or useful for the farmers to grow the type of peanuts that would be demanded in the market, especially by uh, large processing firms that are making uh, a snack food called chanachu. So <clears throat> the technical fix was how to get uh, the right groundnut seed into farmers' hands. So we could have gone and just bought that and given it to them, and that would have been the technical fix. But our focus was on, well, at the higher level system thing, why can't, uh, what is the disconnect between the commercial sector and the seed sector such that the processing firms can figure out how to get a feedback loop to the seed sector so that they're, they, so that if they want something specific, they would uh, have some way of communicating through to the seed sector and to the farmers so that they got the right seed and there would be a, a, a feedback mechanism that drove ongoing innovation with one level, uh, higher level kind of bias problem we're running into because they weren't talking to each other. And the other was, how does, how does then a firm, a specific firm, identify the right seed, identify the right sources of seed, eventually learn to grow their own version of that seed, but also learn how to market a seed that's new to farmers that farmers aren't sure of. And so the process of building that, that kind of overall feedback loop between a person that's getting seed, organizing seed, farmers, and then getting it to the processor that decides if they want a different kind of feature of that end product that would mean a different variety goes back to the seed and you get this kind of cycle working that's more virtuous. So in there are bunches of technical fixes, but our main issue was trying to get the underlying system to work in a certain way that had a lot of bias problems keeping it from working that way. Thank you, Mike. That's a great example. And I think that the really key to, to highlight is how this approach changes biases that have a long-term impact versus kind of the short-term technical quick fix. Um, and I think that long and short-term impact in terms of the market is, is, a, is a really critical piece to understand how some of the decisions are made on which areas um, to work on. And ultimately, um, you know, I think what the project is doing a lot of now is to focus on inclusive business practices. So how does it work with market actors, um, in other words, various businesses, whoever it might be, that have interest in um, changing their business so that they actually have um, more of a, um, a direct relationship with farmers in some way and in a way that helps their, and helps their businesses. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about some of the contributing success factors because there's something that we don't speak about often and that's why we've put it sort of at the front here, which is that a key determinant of whether an activity operates effectively, an activity being the project at the state in this case, is the nature of the donor team overseeing it and the actual people and relationships involved. And this was a really critical piece um, and spanned from the relationship and the um, almost the culture at the mission level as well as the, um, the individuals that were acting as um, points of contact for the project and even back at headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, and that was really critical. And a lot of what we're seeing here is, um, you know, that continuous engagement with, um, activities is really key. Um, remembering USAID speaks about their project as activities. So when I'm saying activity, I don't mean the specific interventions. I'm talking about the project overall. So having that continuous engagement was really key. And it was interesting because often at a USAID mission level, um, there's kind of the thought that, um, you know, that, that heavy workloads um, are a reason why USAID staff are often not able to engage with activities as much. But um, I think that what we were seeing now is that the US, from the USAID staffing side, it was really critical um, in implementing a market systems program that there was enough bandwidth to actually engage with um, the project uh, in a meaningful way. Um, 
the openness to redirecting the project midstream. I mean, this project really did a, a 180 degree turn from where it had started, and I think that was really critical and needed mission support. Um, openness to new ideas and testing and willingness to learn. I mean, a lot of what we're um, seeing in the market systems programs are um, active, you know, small time-bound activities to test what has traction in the market and which market actors are actually able to test new things. And having that ability to test and learn is, is really critical. Um, levels of trust with the mission in terms of the project um, uh, trying new things and understanding approaches, sort of frequent um, open communication, um, and having the um, USA counterparts being involved in the design and learning process and being interested in wanting to learn. I think that was a really critical piece. Um, but Mike, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of this openness to testing new ideas and willingness to learn and how that testing of ideas um, is really essential in, a, in, a, in your project. Uh, yeah, I think this comes out in a, in a, in a couple of different ways that I think are, were quite interesting as a, as a learning processing for me. So uh, a couple of things that uh, became more clear over time is that when you're running a market systems project and you're testing a lot of things, you're doing it uh, in relationship to activity. So say we're doing these studies. A lot of time we're doing small pieces of analysis, but the analysis is, is as much for the market actor or, uh, and is done in a way that doesn't necessarily always produce a perfectly defined piece of uh, deliverable, if you want. But you know, USAID, as it's structured, uh, often can get down into everything being uh, ring-fenced as a specific thing. So if I spend money on, on something, I need to have a deliverable that looks exactly the, you know, like a perfect deliverable. And that kind of opens up a market systems program to being attacked or, or get into trouble. If, for example, it, it's doing a lot of small uh, pieces of research, but doing it in a way that's mostly defined around getting the market actor to make some new decision points or take on new risk. So the, the deliverable for me in there is not necessarily the, some long written document. It is the action I'm getting of the market actor. But that sometimes doesn't translate into the, the, the kind of reports I need to write or the, you know, the, 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 the analysis of did every dollar I spend get used on something that I can go back and show something back. So having that openness around how, to, how management even works in a market system program, what the deliverable I'm looking for, uh, is something that we needed to have lots of conversations about. The other thing that uh, I think is interesting about this is the, the the process of change is more micro than you would think. So there's not a lot of massive decision points. There's a lot of micro changes in sometimes. And a lot of those micro changes sometimes, if I'm not communicating, they're not being communicated all the time to USA, you'll get down two a month and we're already pretty far down a different path because we're we're tracking the momentum of specific market actors, or we're tracking mo momentum around uh, a new market uh, emerging in terms of consumer demand or diversification in a specific segment. And we're helping a firm track that and test that that will give them more margin to invest more in their farmers. So as that process is happening and we're tracking where the momentum's going, you know, if USAID's not aware and then six, three months down the road that looks different from what they're expecting, that can create some communication gaps as well. So, you know, the, the communication is quite open, but, you know, the market system program is substantially more different than how USAID is set up to manage. So the market, so when you're running a market system program, you're always kind of vulnerable to, to being looked at through traditional lenses and seen as if you're not doing certain things or right, which essentially, you know, then you have to kind of work with USAID to, to to understand why that doesn't look that way and why you're doing something different or why the livable looks different and it actually is working in a certain way that, that is getting you value, but it doesn't uh, fit the traditional parameters. Great. Thanks, Mike. And that's a really useful example. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the adaptations in the actual intervention design and implementation. Um, uh, without going into too many examples, there's a, there are a lot of examples on the, the project um, website, avcbd.org. Um, but we did want to put the um, 
this diagram up on the screen, and we call this the Agricultural Market Systems Change Wheel. And this was just a tool that was developed by the project as um, a, a way to understand the different areas that the um, project was considering um, and, and working in. And um, just the, this wheel actually expands out in levels. It's got sort of three other levels around it, so it goes into a lot of detail. There's a, a link on the, the, um, the page there for where you can find more information on that, that wheel. Um, and I, it is on AgriLinks as well, um, if you Google that. Um, the, um, and the tech team has just said if you wanted to expand your screen, you can use the four arrows at the top of the screen. Um, thank you for showing us where that is, tech team. Um, but then you do lose the chat box, So, but if you did want to expand um, what we're looking at. So what this, um, what this change wheel was useful in doing was almost to provide a more holistic overview and kind of an understanding of system change that was um, more than a linear results chain. Um, if you look at the, the top two segments of the change wheel, they talk about core systems. Um, on the one side, the orange talks about supply chain management system, and the other is the input distribution network system. And these were the core systems that the, um, the project was really working in, in terms of agriculture, was you know working with big buyers to kind of reinf to strengthen their supply chain management system down to the farmer level, ultimately providing benefit to farmers because more information is passing through, they're managing those farmers, they're able to select farmers that are better performers um, and know where to invest in the system. And then on the input distribution side, you've got your input supply network and really expanding that through dealers and through retailers to be able to provide more um, support, capacity, information um, with farmers and have farmers become more affiliated to specific um, uh, input suppliers to actually be able to build trust and to be open to trying um, new inputs and accessing more. So um, the uh, uh, the core systems are really a critical piece, and the the sort of little words on the the outside of each of those segments speaks a little bit about some of those areas um, that are specific areas to work with within each of those firms. Um, at the bottom are a green, purple, and and blue segment, and those are really um, representing the um, uh, the behavior change within other systems and counterbalances and and things that counterbalance and reinforce that change. So, you know, whether it's your um, uh, agricultural support services system, your business services systems, other interconnected systems that reinforce the change that is happening in the, um, the core systems with the buyers and the input suppliers. And that's a really critical piece. And um, this, tool, this tool was actually used to say to project staff, well, you know, which areas are you focusing in now and which areas are needed to kind of reinforce and balance um, um, other areas. Um, and Chrissy has uh, shared the link to, um, to that change wheel um, in the chat box too. Um, Mike, do you want to speak a little bit about this, this, um, the, the, the real importance of not only focusing on working in core systems, but also in some of the sort of counterbalancing and reinforcing systems with maybe an example? And you're still on mute. Great, so Mike is on mute. Let's see if he unmutes, and otherwise I will talk through an example of this one. Mike. I, did, I didn't, can you, you, Mike. You, uh, you went out for a second. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, we can. Can you uh, repeat what you said? It went out here. I did actually uh, lost this, the thing that you were probably trying to transition to me. I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> That's perfect, Mike. I was asking if you could speak a little bit about um, the importance of not only working in core systems, but also in these counterbalancing um, and reinforcing um, areas that support the work in the core systems, with maybe an example. Uh, sure. So <clears throat> uh, one of the ones that we use quite extensively is marketing firms uh, that would be under business, other business services. So well, the issue we had uh, is in the input distribution system, it was really, it, it had evolved and self-organized as a trading system, not a retail system. And I'd make that distinction meaning that uh, each individual just worried about selling to the one next to them. They didn't really focus in on where the product was going to the end market, and they didn't really make any effort to control for uh, the value at the end market. 
So when we were working with suppliers, what we got, what we needed to have them understand is what really a mass marketing strategy would need. And what I meant, what we mean by mass marketing strategy is a strategy that would take into account the, the fact that the product itself would move through multiple distribution networks or multiple individual businesses before it got to the end market. And then if a large firm wanted to sell a really high quality seed to millions of farmers in the southern part of Bangladesh, they would have to understand what a mass marketing strategy was because up to then they just picked two or three distributors sold their seed to them and then just well, turned their back and, and rarely ever engaged in trying to understand what the farmer, which was their end customer, thought of that seed. So by using marketing firms, and in a lot of cases helping the marketing firm understand, what we were trying to do is get the marketing firm to work with the big supply firm to develop these strategies. But by getting the marketing firm to do it, we would be able to give them the ability to sell their services to other firms so that we'd leave behind a, an inbuilt understanding of how mass marketing works in the agricultural inputs retail system. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. And, um, you know, I think that this this change wheel is something, as I mentioned, that we could dig deeper in into an upcoming webinar if people are interested. So let us know if you are interested in, in talking more about this. Um, you know, it was really interesting because the project really spoke about how initially it was so um, over-focused on reaching specific targets. Um, and, you know, initially that dr the targets that were set um, as part of the project drove the intervention design. And it was interesting because um, one of the interviews that I had with the project staff said recently, you know, the, it was just almost just like you're driving a car and you're always looking in your rearview mirror and your rearview mirror is your targets. It's always behind you. You know what you're trying to achieve, but it's not in front of you. It's not what's driving the thing that you need to do and the way you're going to design what you do. What you're designing what to do is relevant to what market actors need to do to grow their businesses in a way that you know is inclusive. Um, and so, Mike, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about this transition from sort of focusing on targets as a way to design interventions, um, although targets are always important. Um, and maybe while talking about that, two of the questions that have come up in the chat are linked to, you know, are we just trying to make the wealthy businesses rich? And, you know, what about these corrupt middlemen along the chain? And, you know, kind of this this question that often comes up. But um, but maybe you can speak a little bit about targets um, and versus working with, with businesses in different ways. So uh, there's a couple of things uh, quick on that. So when we see the targets, so targets are relative to indicators, and indicators are set uh, kind of universally across USAID. So uh, the indicators themselves, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, look at the technical, almost like a technical fix in a lot of ways, or they look at a, a point in time, um, which means that if you're trying to force a target to be met, you know, the project itself can certainly try to, you know, engage in, in um, uh, direct delivery and stuff that will have no lasting impact. Uh, and why that is important is almost specifically related to this, uh, why it's important to not think that way from a systems perspective, is specifically related to this question of, well, if the system itself is filled with, uh, you know, traders that are cheating or people that are, uh, you know, since he, I assume when you say, when somebody says a rich guy, they're talking about somebody who's extractive, who's, who acts in business ways that's not, un, uh, you know, unprofessional or even downright, um, you know, corrupt. So to understand why a trader who is just a, a person trying to make money, why they act in a way that, that would encourage them to steal or cheat or manipulate uh, um metrics, for example, they, in a lot of cases what we saw was that traders would manipulate either the size of the bag or the, the weighing machines themselves as a way to kind of get a little extra without paying for it from farmers. But at the same time, the farmer themselves were actively engaged in the wetting crop. They were act engaged in increasing the weight of crop. It wasn't that farmers were less corrupt than the traders, what we saw, was that the tr farmers didn't have the power to win the negotiation half the time. The traders had more leverage and could take advantage of or put farmers in a position from their weakness so that they could take advantage more often. So the issue what we found was that the, the systems analysis gave us more insight into why the system had self-organized around uh, behaviors that were uh, short-term win-lose thinking. Zero-sum is the term we used. So uh, 
by focusing on targets, we were we were specifically not getting at those issues. We were not getting at these difficult problems around how the system self-organized, and people thought it was in their interest. It was the greater good for them to steal from a farmer today so that they could have money to take their kid to school as a trader. You know, that getting in and understanding their mindset is quite critical, but you have to use different analytical tools. And then for us, we when I first get in there, we, we had to kind of take a little bit of a drastic step and uh, and told the whole staff that they weren't allowed to mention targets and weren't allowed to talk about targets anymore. We just needed to talk about the specific behaviors we wanted to see changed and how could we get those changes uh, and test different ways to get those changes in those behaviors as a way to kind of quickly get people off the fear that they were feeling when I first got there about targets, about losing their jobs, that they don't reach targets and things like that, to the idea that they could think more openly and critically about what are they seeing in there. If, for example, a trader is being uh, corrupt or perceived as not, doing, uh, not being open and fair and transparent, Let's understand why they're doing it and then understand what are the real issues around that. What are the incentives and biases driving that? And if we're working with a large business that is that is made money in the past, we have to then look at them to say, well, why are they acting in a way that, that uh, is enriching them and not enriching all of their uh, what should be alliances with farmers, traders, transporters, and even customers that they're selling to? And as we found large businesses that said, oh, well, it makes sense for us to change our business strategy, give up some of our uh, margin so that we could grow our business, meaning make it much larger and much more valuable, but maybe not be as large a profit margin. And then that also generates more wealth for its farmers and customers and distributors that we could work with them to change their business strategy. Great. Thank you, Mike. And that, that was such a critical piece, I think, for, even for the staff initially who would come in and think the um, working with big business is bad or working with any business or how do you, you know, sort of bypass the middleman and rather that the project was really focusing on, well, how do you change those businesses' behavior and practice so that it actually becomes supportive of better, positive, inclusive change in the market. So it was a, so that's a really critical um, uh, sort of mindset change that I think we saw that the project really had to um, to work through. It was interesting because also um, what we saw in this case study is that um, in terms of private sector engagement, the, um, that from the market systems approach, the, the project really needed to interact with the core business strategy departments. And so often, um, the, um, before the project was working more with CSR, sort of corporate social responsibility departments within firms, which wasn't actually changing any of the core business practices. So maybe a firm would get a grant from the project and would um, be delivering training to farmers or something, but it wasn't because they really were changing the way their core business operated, which kind of links back to some of the questions in the chat on, you know, why would you, how, why would you work with these businesses anyway if they carry on sort of doing business as usual? And, I think linking to those core business strategy departments was a real challenge for this project, um, where you know key people were continually sidelined, not only to CSR departments, um, which then isolated the activities from the core business of the firm, but also very interestingly um, in um, in terms of the uh, donor liaison department. So one of the things that was started in, in Bangladesh, and I know there are a lot of people from Bangladesh on this this webinar, um, but also um, can be seen in some other countries, is that the, the businesses, not just international business, but the local um, na national businesses had developed um, and have developed very sophisticated departments that liaise with donors so that it's almost not a CSR department, but they know how to write proposals, they know how to write donor budgets, how to get donor funds, um, and, you know, it kind of just, it, it becomes a new business strategy um, for those firms. So you're really not impacting any of the core business of those firms. Um, Mike, could you speak a little bit about some of the challenges in um, kind of being sidelined to the donor liaison department or the CSR department and how critical it was to work with those core business strategy departments and when the project started working with those departments, how it made a fundamental shift in um, the effectiveness of, of many of the activities? 
Yeah, sure. I think, and this even gets back to the last point we were uh, was making before about the the traders or the businesses, uh, in, and, and whether and why you work with them from a systems perspective. So well, Bangladesh is a little bit of a unique case in that uh, there is like an international donor industrial complex. You almost talk about in terms of the range and sophistication of NGOs that uh, receive international donor money. It, it seems so pervasive that a lot of the large businesses started to create their own departments to essentially compete for that market since it was large enough and seemed lucrative enough for them rather than sticking to their core business. So when we were engaging them uh, you know, around the idea of you know, what is their core business and how do they act in the market and do they act in a way that actually generates the returns that they want from growth or value addition as we define it. So one of the things is that probably useful is to say when we define inclusive business, we have some very specific metrics we look at, including the strategic orientation of businesses, and is it is it really short-term profit-driven, of which then we would say we're not as focused on them, or are they open to uh, an orientation and a strategic orientation towards growth and value addition to their customers and their staff and their suppliers? If they're looking at creating value in their business strategy, then they would often, if we talk to them for long enough, they would start to understand that this is a potential business strategy that needs to go be, or conversation that needs to be held in their core business strategies. As a few of the firms started to see and understand what we were talking about and then started to test some of the suggestions we had together and kind of see what made sense for them, they started to see that there is this competitive opportunity for them to be more engaging with other actors, to be more allied with other actors, even invest in other actors as part of their core business strategy. But that did not happen until after they realized that what we were talking to them about was not us hiring them to run a project, but about how they engaged in their market activities, how they engaged in their business. And that took quite a while for a number of businesses. And some of them, uh, quite frankly, we never could crack, we could never get through to them because all they really wanted was to run a project for us as a kind of as a consulting firm, um, you know, branded as a business, but in the end they weren't really interested in uh, doing the things, changing their core business tactics. Thanks, Mike. Um, and I, you know, I think that that was really interesting because it meant that you you almost had to the project had to you know get some quick wins so that it got, um, you know, with with businesses that weren't always starting with the biggest businesses. Sometimes you'd work with slightly smaller businesses um, to kind of start showing that the project actually got sort of gained some credibility in the market in terms of what it was doing, um, and also starting maybe even with bigger subsidies, sort of bigger bigger um, areas that the project was paying for. Um, and testing new activities and slowly decreasing that as new firms were coming on board. And I think what we're seeing more recently is firms are actually contacting the project. The core business strategy departments are saying, we'd like to work with you because we're hearing about and seeing what you're doing and we'd like to expand and grow our business, which is kind of, I think, the ideal situation where um, it's taking away sort of projects going to look for long-term partners that they're working with and they're keeping the same partners throughout the life of the project, but rather having um, sort of short-term arrangements with with uh, firms, and as they start changing their behavior to work in a more inclusive way um, that the project can see is actually going to be beneficial to the market and not have them play sort of this mean entrepreneur trader um, space to actually then invest more in them um, in helping them grow their their uh, strategies in that way. Um, so, so really useful. Um, one of the interesting areas um, that the project was working on was really strengthening service providers um, for the private sector. And it was really interesting, yeah, we're not just talking about service providers um, as in the picture on the, the left, which are kind of, you know, in this case, spray service providers um, uh, within the value chains, um, although that was a critical piece. So the project realized that to, um, you know, if you want to introduce a new technology to a farmer, build up a lot of the informal service providers, tractor drivers, spray service providers to take on and be able to take on new activities um, at, a, at a much more sophisticated level and be able to provide those services to smallholders. That meant you could radically change the speed of uptake of the technology that the, the smallholder was taking on. So working at that level with service providers within specific um, 
uh, value chains, for example, was really critical. But what the project also did, which I think was, was particularly interesting in this case, was to work with um, sort of broader cross-cutting national service providers. So instead of the project staff playing the role of helping a firm on how to brand or how to do new marketing strategies to smallholder farmers, um, it would work with um, groups or, or diff several different local marketing firms or local research firms, um, market research firms or branding firms and in working with them slowly empower them to understand how to work in the agricultural sector which is often new for them um, and therefore have that as a long-lasting service in the market so in both these cases you're talking about providing um, establishing service providers and building their capacity to really support and grow the agricultural sector way beyond the life of the project um, in strengthening that system and I think that was a particularly interesting um, strategy which was able to leverage um, uh, impact um, at a much bigger level. Mike, do you want to speak a little bit about maybe an example of, of how that was useful um, from the project perspective? Sure, I'll take, uh, I'd mentioned the marketing firms before, but I've mentioned one that uh, it seems is a little bit different than what I've seen in other projects. We use, we worked with event management firms and we're using, working with event management firms to help um, industries create a better connection and better feedback loop with customers. So uh, in this case, we've done, we've helped a fir, uh, some event firms develop farmer, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, consumer flower shows. Uh, the first one, I think, attracted about 11 or 12,000 people. The second one, about 30,000 people. Uh, we're in the middle of doing similar types of things for on the input side, especially for uh, technologies so that uh, Farmers, as customers, will have better access on an, and access on an ongoing basis to see new technologies uh, in in events, live events that are run by professional management firms. There is a there's a capacity uh, or skill set of event manager firms we've noticed in Bangladesh uh, for consumer fairs and things like that. But that that group hadn't really been identified and and you know, leverage to see how that could be more effective in the agriculture sector. So we uh, focused in on that as a as one service uh, area that could be quite effective at making sure from the cons end consumer side uh, to the actual farmer as consumer side, you there's these live events that are constantly going out, uh, explaining new technologies, giving access to them, letting them see it and letting it touching it as a com as a larger kind of marketing effort for an industry as opposed to the specific firm marketing strategies that we were working with when we work with marketing firms. Thanks, Mike. Um, and I think it was interesting because those, the sort of consumer shows that you spoke about started in the flower sector and now I kind of, I think that's happening in some of the other value chains too. So mung bean or whatever it might be and having these even locally driven um, consumer fairs. Um, and another example that was interesting in this project was, I know we often talk about sort of these stakeholder meetings and stakeholder dialogues, and I, d I think there was sort of a, when the project, f it didn't take that as a starting point to every activity, but when the project found that that could be useful, um, having local facilitation firms coming in and actually being empowered to be able to do that kind of stakeholder facilitation for the industry that ultimately the industry would hide, hire directly to have that kind of service provided. Um, so a lot of great e examples there. Um, another um, interesting area was really having the project um, sort of promote this culture of innovation within private sector firms that it was working with. So almost showing market actors how to market themselves. So the project could assist those market actors um, by learning how to market themselves better to bring more innovations to the fore. And, and, you know, some examples that I'll give quickly are, you know, machines that maybe more efficiently mill lentils or peas or coconut hair, um, pithkoi, um, which then would be more broadly available for leasing by farmers or by processes or solar power units for mango storage that require less electricity and greatly reduce decomposition of the mangoes but then would be more widely available to the sector overall. So a lot of those types of um, innovations which, which was really um, really interesting. Um, Mike, one of the questions in the chat um, is, you know, which, when you w decided which kind of companies to work with, um, or at least approached companies, which kind were more responsive? Um, and maybe this is sort of talking about, um, you know, how the project was found that it was easier to sort of work on the input side first, 
um, rather than the um, uh, sorry, someone's moving the slides. Um, uh, to work on the input side first, rather than on the um, the buyer side, and also maybe with sort of working with smaller companies first. Could you speak a little bit about the type of companies that were more responsive? Uh, sure. So <clears throat> this has actually uh, been a a, tr uh, a consistent thing across the last couple of projects I've worked on. The input side tends to move faster, and the firms uh, selling stuff tend to move faster for, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is because there's immediate feedback. Usually, if we're helping them do promotional events or they engage in improving their distribution networks, they see sales and they and they react to them. So they start to we start to have credibility, and they give us more latitude to help them test new strategies and stuff like that. On the buying from farmer side, there's usually a long history. And it's represented in some of these questions, uh, the kind of bias that you see. There's a long history of, of perceptions of cheating traders or of um, lots of win-lose transaction or tac uh, tactics in negotiation towards transactions. There's lots of, uh, there's, there's often not so uh, that many structured markets, uh, essentially contract farming markets, structures in those markets. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, historical disputes. There's a lot of other things that, mean for the supply, there are some preconditions that need to be in there before large firms really are willing to take on substantial strategic changes uh, on the buying side. After quite a bit of work we did on the buying side, uh, we, through things like Global Gaps uh, seminars, through uh, market research that showed that consumers, if marketed properly, the end consumers, they would pay a 10 to 20 percent premium for uh, properly managed crop that that would that had a known origin for example then we then we started to see in the last six months firms that will large firms that will start to invest or are starting to invest in their supply chain and that's been a, a substantial change because uh, there we had one for a while and then one another one kind of creeped in uh, and then but these were kind of medium smaller firms that were more supply chain managers sold up to larger firms and in the last number of months, two or three very large firms, including some, the substantial supermarkets in the country, have come to us to ask about re restructuring their supply chain management strategies so that they could uh, essentially start control their supply chain in line with things like Global Gap for premium markets that we're also helping them develop in terms of how to market, how to merchandise in stores, how to create premium value, how to create confidence in customers. One of the things that was interesting in the conversation I had with them from our analysis, what, what they kept on saying were, you know, the consumers are price sensitive. And I was saying that our research is saying they're not price sensitive. They're trust sensitive. You have a trust problem with them, not a price problem with them. And as they started to understand what that meant, they were uh, consistently more interested in the strategies to build trust with their end consumers, which would often mean that they would be able to get premiums. That would then allow them to cover the cost of building in this supply chain. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the interesting areas of the project was how they diversified the team and restructured the team. And um, what you have on the screen now is is kind of a sort of a, a quick overview of what it looked like um, sort of after the in the initial few years where the um, there was a chief of party. The project was divided in that this team was structured into these different value chains: the food value chains, the non-food value chains, some of the cross-cutting areas like nutrition, gender. Um, environmental compliance, then sort of this organizational capacity piece, M&E separately, outreach on, in terms of communication and the web specialist, and then the finance and grants team. Um, and so I want to sh show you, the, I'm going to move on from this slide, which is really trying to reinforce how these areas were sort of stovepiped, um, especially amongst the food chains and the non-food value chains, um, to what, what the, the structure looks like now. So what's on the screen right now is the, is the current structure. I think the project recognizes that it's still not necessarily an ideal space, but they've been able to move um, with sort of slow approval or, or continued approval from USAID at every level um, to move to restructure the team. 
So now there's more of a, a core systems team um, that makes up of um, various the sort of market systems team leaders. So rather than doing food and non-food or being divided by value chains, um, also there's an, a knowledge management team which is really critical. Um, it's kind of the sort of taking this M and E and knowledge management function um, and integrating those, and then also. Um, the looking at some of these interconnected systems most in terms of market entrepreneurship um, branding specialists marketing and media specialists private sector investment and access to finance specialists um, behavior change and gender um, managers and um, so th those were really uh, those were critical um, sort of changes that happened and um, part of this was recognizing that so the teams cut across all value chains in the agricultural sector and although some value chains might have certain crop specific issues or interventions such as maybe mango or groundnut for most the same issues the same challenges the same opportunities cut across all value chains um, and in practice only you know very few farmers farm only one type of crop um, and very few traders or buyers buy only one type of crop. And so it wasn't very efficient to have the team organized by specific crop and by these particular value chains um, because it wasn't reflective of market realities. And then also um, there were uh, so sort of the new the new team structure sort of paid more attention to some of this agro machinery and agro technology um, areas by dedicating a team that was working on linking research, government and private sector stakeholders um, and disseminating knowledge and technology to support this kind of commercial service provider industry which may have been lost in, in with another sort of structural um, focus and also having the dedicated communications team promoted this com constant communication between the technical and operations teams and that also supported this cross-learning the cooperation um, between what the operational team were doing and the technical team and we'll speak in a few minutes about how some of that contracting changed as well to support that and the entrepreneurship SME sort of development teams was an important addition um, to this restructuring because it recognized that there was sort of this middle tier of SMEs that was a you know kind of the 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 someone referred to this earlier in the chat box as kind of the greedy middleman and th th there was this kind of lost SME tier that was a significant challenge but that really instead of bypassing them kind of needed to be a focus on how do you kind of change behavior um, within that space um, so that really that really helped as well and um, to strengthen kind of this whole CLA approach and the learning and adaptation cycle the M&E team now not only included the data collection and the monitoring folks but also this knowledge management and CLA function um, with uh, field monitoring offices um, and I'll, I'll mention the last significant change was was really um, a really interesting one because um, instead, what AVC did was instead of trying to have a very small uh, headquarters staff and sort of pushing everyone out to field offices, which it had done at the start of the project so that staff could really be entrenched in the field, what it did was to say, let's bring staff back to headquarters and reduce the size of the field offices so that we can actually not only have more learning within the staff and closer collaboration within the staff teams, technical teams, but also so that the focus became working through the project partners um, and the private sector firms to actually do the interventions at the field level. Um, so that was, a, that was a really important shift. Um, Mike, I don't know if you want to speak through sort of maybe maybe just in terms of sort of the most fundamental piece that you think was was beneficial. Yeah, I know you said this isn't necessarily a reflection of a, a perfect scenario, but it's kind of moving towards that. Uh, yeah, I think the big change the the big change was the re or the organization the reorganization was part of a larger shift in the focus of the program to to for not being project specific or project oriented and being market system change oriented. So the, the changes all ref, kind of reflect in the organization structure how the team was going to be responsive to what the market system was telling us about what, what and where change was possible and making sure that we would be able to understand it, communicate it and adjust effectively to whatever the opportunities the market system was presenting us uh, for change. So in a lot of cases, you know, the issues were 
you know, the, the cross-cutting team before, as it was called, was really all project things, uh, you know, that were required by USAID for USAID and not really reflective of what the what the challenges we we're seeing in the market in the market system itself including uh, really poor understandings of marketing the the market the overall agricultural system as we were looking at it and certainly most of the uh, value chains we we're looking at specifically were as an industry or as a commercial uh, sector was substantially more immature than the other sectors in Bangladesh so you could see where there was these emerging specialized services in marketing for, um, you know, there's a ready-made garment sector, there's an emerging electronic, consumer electronics sector there. Those were, uh, those were more sophisticated, and you were seeing how they were uh, managing skill sets that were more sophisticated. And those skill sets needed to be in agriculture. So, you know, looking at marketing, ICT, we were looking at media, we were looking at, um, you know, issues about how entrepreneurship works in uh, agriculture, which are... Uh, key components to the way the overall market system needed to change. So we needed to uh, adjust our organization structure to be able to adjust to what the market system was telling us and what and how the system needed to change. Great. Thank you, Mike. That's super useful. It was really interesting in working with staff that there was also this um, constant need to improve staff's market facilitation skills. Um, and you know, I think one of the interesting challenges we, we um, heard about was kind of the, the challenge for project team to learn that once a firm started to change behavior in a certain way that would start being more inclusive and beneficial to the market system, it was time for the project to start working on a new area with that firm or in another part of the market system with other firms. And so rather than to say, well, this is working, let's just roll this out in more areas and take this across the country, we're saying, okay, this one has started to shift. Where do we start shifting other areas? Um, and I think that was a really uh, an interesting um, piece for the team. And it also had... Um, uh, implication on freeing the team up to be able to um, feel confident. I think, you know, in the beginning, the team members kind of felt like, okay, there's this perfect answer out there. We're going to hold back and not do something until we get a specialist in or a technical person or a consultant in. And that really was um, sort of debilitating for the team. And I think a really critical change that everyone speaks about was when they felt that they had the, they were empowered to be able to meet with market actors and make decisions during meetings and say, yes, let's try this for three months. Let's test this. It's not going to make a, you know, we, we starting even with maybe the smaller firms or smaller activities that might not, if they don't work well, that's okay. It's not going to radically shift that market system. It's not going to disrupt in a big way. And having the freedom as staff to be able to start thinking about where can they try things and where can they test things and how do they interact with the firm was a really significant um, change space um, rather than relying on outside um, experts. I mean, the project really built facilitation skills in, in many ways, and um, there are a few pictures there on the screen, but, um, you know, constantly the project was running um, uh, training sessions. They started um, sort of this transition process with a week-long long, um, uh, session for the staff. They had ongoing online learning platforms that the staff were interacting with. They had l ongoing four-week learning challenges with staff. Um, they had um, sort of market system simulation trainings that staff were interacting with. Um, and and just, a, you know, not only through these formalized spaces, but I think continually allowing staff to um, feel that they were in um, learning environments. So keeping meetings with sort of larger number of people and focusing um, the any of the annual, um, so sort of rather having a, a performance review, they changed those into quarterly learning sessions. So they'd kind of have these quarterly learning meetings where they would talk about, well, what are they learning? Not just reporting back on what have we achieved and what have we done and how we've been successful, but rather what are we learning and how do we change, sort of adapt drop or expand different areas that we um, that we are focused on so that you know each team was able to say well you know what are the things we want that we've tried that we want to adapt what are the things we want to drop um, what are the things we want to expand um, and that was a really critical shift too, to to have staff be empowered to be part of those discussions rather than simply sort of a reporting um, discussion um, uh, and during those sort of portfolio, quarterly portfolio reviews or learning meetings, um, everyone had to identify what is one intervention that needs to be shifted, one that's not working, one that needs to be dropped, or one that needs to be expanded. Um, so, Mike, I don't know if you want to say um, something, maybe just a minute, on 
sort of empowering staff in terms of this um, improving market facilitation skills? I uh, just I think a couple of different things. So uh, in the organizational chart, I didn't really say, but was uh, a central component to it that kind of led uh, or is intertwined in all this is um, we made it a lot flatter. We made it a lot more team oriented, and then in even the uh, internal staff performance review process, we shifted that and and uh, weighted a lot more things like uh, leadership, team learning, teams building skills, learning skills as the key kind of performance criteria of which we were judging staff on their performance. So from uh, actual staff performance to the organization to uh, even how we structured the office is uh, open plan with, you know, couches around. There's a, there's a, we even created this interesting whiteboard slash ping pong table so people could go in there and, and uh, use a table for whiteboarding and even play ping pong at the same time. And the idea was to essentially start breaking up the culture of the, of the project so that we would get more free-flowing exchanges and be more open about the, uh, the challenges and the opportunities we would see. And, that would, and then as they got, you know, we helped with the management to give them more freedom, even more decision-making, they became more empowered during the conversations and then giving them during those conversations to say, let's go do it. Again, it's been this uh, a process of evolved change over time that included spaces and metrics and management strategies uh, that that kind of over time in, continued to increase the capacity of the of the team to be substantially more efficient operationally and a lot more effective oper with uh, market actors. Great, thanks, Mike. And you know, one of the questions in the in the chat from Basim Nasser is saying, you know, what about did you have to sort of hire new people and change the kind of profile of people you're hiring, and even have let some people go? And I think what what the project had to do there was sort of a a, a funding change towards the end of the project. So instead of wrapping up staff by the end, they had to staff start a little bit earlier. Um, so that was a one process of sort of where staff were let go. But it did, I think, the project did start focusing on hiring people that had more private sector experience. Um, um, I, often sort of some of the younger people were interesting because they probably had to unlearn some of the, it didn't take as long to unlearn some of the other practices, um, which was interesting. Um, and, you know, someone else has asked sort of how easy was it to work with, um, actually uh, to recruit women, um, and especially in terms of women who could work with women farmers and entrepreneurs. Um, Mike, do you want to speak to that quickly, sort of this changing, what kind of profile was useful in working with women? Uh, sure. The uh, interesting, the over time, the project uh, we didn't uh, remove very many people because we weren't really allowed to remove people. Uh, but over time, the team got a lot younger and uh, and a lot more uh, women friendly. You'd say so. The balance there was a lot more women involved in, in in the current staffing structure than than there was at the beginning. We didn't do that necessarily to deal with uh, women farmers because uh, in a lot of ways we didn't and uh, we weren't doing a lot of direct interaction with women farmers. Uh, we're dealing with gender in a little bit of a different way than, than kind of just identifying women farmers and training them specifically. What we're trying to do with them is find out where the commercial opportunities are for women to, to, to engage and engage in a process that would allow them to move up functionally, take on more functions, uh, because some of the gender roles are not uh, organized in this uh, or more open. Uh, so, and when we're working with uh, the female staff, uh, we, we've had and started something recently, Margie may want to talk about this also because I've asked her for help. Uh, we have had uh, discussions in terms of the office that was specifically related to uh, local cultural professional issues with women and, and some of the concerns they have that, that we as a project could take on to make it easier for them to function. And one of the issues that came up in that conversation I thought was really interesting was the difficulty of certain partners because we we empowered women to go engage partners directly um, and, and take leading uh, kind of client relationship roles, as we call them, with certain partners. And some of those partners, uh, you know, weren't being respectful of them. So we're in the process now of figuring out how to manage it so we don't remove women unless they want to be removed. But we give them the, the, the kind of tools to manage clients, but also the rules that we would, uh, with a framework so it would be easier for women to deal with those things. Um, it was, this is, in that in particular has been a quite an interesting issue but one that we've looked at quite a lot because one of the issues that we'd say in gender is, and we've looked at this more from the system side, is these gender roles and roles that are uh, 
that, get, that can be particularly restrictive in parts of Bangladesh, essentially limit a fairly important human capacity from participating in the market, which uh, essentially limits the market's ability to solve problems and be innovative. So we are trying to figure out how to do it, but we're trying to do it in a way that makes sense relative to the local context. Good. Thank you, Mike. Um, I wanted to um, move on to talk a little bit about another particularly interesting part of this um, uh, activity of the project was the grants process and the documentation requirements. Um, so, you know, USAID has been rolling out sort of some some interesting um, uh, sort of I'd say tests in terms of how to do innovative procurement. Um, one of those is called the broad agency announcement, and um, what. Uh, the AVC project did was to take that broad agency announcement as a procurement tool and adapt it for use at a project level, and they called it the blanket activity announcement. Um, where and and within that, they also had a, what they call adaptive market active actor agreements. And this was kind of a substantial shift in the operation and grants management that supported more of a market systems approach, where the private sector becomes part of a co-creation process. Um, and the core business units of the private sector become part of that process with the project. So they together are working on deciding on what are ways that the firm um, can grow and in the in that the project finds would be more um, inclusive. And so what this did was it changed having a long-term uh, contract um, with a private sector firm and defining up front what all those activities would be and rather introduce sort of these much more um, time-bound three-month to six-month um, uh, agreements where the firms would test and try certain activities and if they seem to gain momentum or work in a certain way they'd maybe start exploring other areas um, and this this was really um, essential in kind of being able to crowd in different market actors rather than sort of define specific partners up front and they try to make the process as you know, uncumbersome and much more collaborative and adapt adaptive um, for the market actors that were being worked with because often the market actors that the project wanted to work with were those that didn't actually know how to write the proposals or do contracting with the donor projects and, you know, they wanted to be able to find those those um, sort of more innovative, um, thought-leading uh, firms that were more open to change or exploring things or working in a, in a much more... Um, a commercial way, and so they needed a a, a grants process that would um, uh, would support that. And what was very interesting was, you know, in the beginning there was a lot of challenges between sort of the the grants team or the operational team and the technical team because the technical team could change their approach, but then the ops people would come and say, "But hang on, we still need this specific grant and the specific budget and these deliverables and whatever it was," which would kind of be counterintuitive to the way that the relationship had been positioned by the technical team with the the private sector partners. And so the it was really key in in talking through some of that sort of staff facilitation that happened was that the operational teams were were um, sort of trained in market systems approaches as much as the technical team so they could start working together to explore adaptations. Um, Mike, do you want to speak a little bit about how the adaptive market actor agreement um, and the blanket activity announcement were really critical? Uh, yeah, so the, the, I think uh, this might be an area that other people are interested in more detail, but I will give the, 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 the objective of this was uh, in you, if people know USAID grant making processes, if you have a large grant uh, component or fund in your program, and if you're doing it traditional, the grant structures and bureaucracy around grant making essentially forces you to make the grant your strategy. The strategy, uh, your tactical strategy or your technical strategy starts being overwhelmed by the bureaucratic structures in the way you have to issue solicitations and run them in a traditional way. So. We knew that when I was coming in, so we sat down with the, the operations person, Gwendolyn Armstrong, uh, Tweed, and what we did was come up with a, a way using a, a known uh, mechanism, this uh, a broad agency announcement, that we could tweak so that we could turn the operational, the, the mechanism through which we fund that interventions, to be strategically, uh, so that would follow our strategy, the technical strategy, rather than it it would over time start to outweigh the technical strategy. So by doing this, we could use uh, shift what we were looking for in the, 
you know, in the solicitation, for example, as it's uh, as it's defined, it to being more objective driven. So the market actor uh, agreement is essentially uh, provides us the kind of strategic framework on which we would run small grants, and each grant would run six to three to six months. And the grant would have details, but details only relative to the strategic objectives outlined in the ad adaptive market agreements. And these would mostly be about growing, um, uh, growing a customer base, uh, increasing um, uh, productivity of, of farmers, or through their or their throughput in their supply chain, things like that. So these are business objectives. Uh, but through this process, the the whole procurement process became additive to the strategy rather than something that you, you kind of either tears down the technical strategy or essentially uh, makes the technical strategy very difficult to apply. Great, good. I wanted to move to talking a little bit about monitoring and evaluation and, um, you know, one of the, the questions from Sarah Dunn was sort of what were the implications of this whole transition to m and &E indicators and reporting? And one of the interesting areas that the, um, the project started looking at was how to measure system health, um, how to measure and understand people and firm behaviors and network structures and qualities and exchanges and flows, sort of flows of resources and information um, between firms and between firms and smallholders, et cetera. Um, and Mike, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about some of that implication. I know we have Elizabeth done on the this um, webinar too and Elizabeth has been really instrumental in working with the project on and the M&E team of the project in understanding more about measuring system health and looking at what type of indicators are most appropriate um, that are that are needed um, by USAID um, and also um, really tell tell more of a story around the market systems approach. Um, so Elizabeth has done is really someone to get to get in touch with about this. But Mike, if you want to say a little bit more. Uh, yeah, and there's two levels to it, or three. There were three things I think it would be useful to say. Uh, the first one is that the USAID reporting kind of kept separate and and intact, then and, and it had rigidities into it that we that we did really deal with in terms of the market systems kind of health analysis. Uh, so so it didn't really affect that. Although uh, in the reporting we certainly applied. Um, language and discussions around how systems change was happening and why it was happening and what how we understood it to be happening. Uh, the second thing is we tried some more uh, formalized ways of understanding system change. We went in a direction of, um, uh, of looking at sentinel indicators or indicators uh, to use as sensors. So sensing issues that were coming out or potential changes. The we went and tried about five or six of them. The ones that seem to be working are the ones that uh, where we can sense whether there's innovation in business practices coming out every regular, and the one where we're seeing people having change in the balance of new to old relationships. Interestingly enough, through some of our uh, initial analysis on the disputes analysis and some first first goes on the system health indicators, we found that there was too much rigidity in the relationships. So in certain areas, traders didn't have interactions with anybody new in a full year, for example. That means that the, just the, the likelihood of innovation, the likelihood of new thinking was very low. So that also then adjusted a lot of our interventions to, to being substantially uh, more focused on how do you bridge networks? How do you create uh, or amplify the incentives for somebody to move in to look for a new relationship? How do you bring people together through stakeholder meetings so they can talk about joint issues that would then create connectivity so they can talk about that stuff. So that has been quite helpful. Uh, the, the third area that I thought is probably the area that we've gotten the best at is as we've opened up, we've had better discussions, we've introduced new ideas, we talk about those new ideas, uh, they become ingrained in the conversations and something that becomes ingrained in the culture of what we're looking for that really the monitoring is integrated into the thinking of the staff and we don't necessarily need a tool. There is one tool that we were trying out which is essentially some metrics on whether a firm uh, was becoming more inclusive and we call it the market actor tracker and we actually got to the point where we were almost about to put it on phones but through the process of uh, de designing it, getting people to talk about it and reporting in it, for the staff became I very focused on what it is, they understood it, and they were constantly looking for it. So we almost didn't need to report on it because it was a thread through all of our conversations. And that process of integrating monitoring 
not necessarily as a formal thing you need to write down or even caption necessarily, but as a, a an under, understanding of what you need to be looking for and talking about and fostering and change about sometimes uh, ended up being quite more important than the, the more formal monitoring processes. Right, good. Thank you, Mike. Um, Claire Coote in the in the discussion has asked a little bit about how much we, you know did the project work with pharma organizations as you know something to encourage aggregation and bargaining power and, and maybe just really briefly on that I think that the, the pro from what we saw in the case study the project um, worked with pharma groups as much as it made sense for private sector firms to start working more um, with uh, grouping farmers, not necessarily only as a production, but really from an input side, um, you know, bulking, being able to bulk sales from from um, a specific region or specific group of farmers makes sense in terms of how that, that company might start working more with farmers or from a, um, you know, or maybe having them as part of a loyalty club or something. And also from the supply chain sort of buyer side, being able to have farmers be part of a, a group that's, um, you're able to identify sort of who are high performing farmers and group them for that purpose as part of your supply chain management system. So really interacting in, in that way. Um, and I wanted to just close with an example. This, this photograph on the screen here, it looks a bit strange. That's actually a, a test marketing stall that was set up because one of the areas the, that the project is, is exploring is the area of safe food. So kind of, you know, whether it's foods that are not covered in pesticides and, and um, and are actually sort of safer to eat. So a safe food value chain and, you know, both working with supermarkets at the one end of the chain and farmers down at the other um, and who can produce this and, and looking at set up, setting up sort of these um, consumer stalls and being able to test, you know, will consumers actually pay more even in a local regional um, area and, you know, do they actually even value different types of um, produce and so that's been you know sort of another example of a lot of these small test spaces that the that the project works with through various um, local firms doesn't have to always be big firms even smaller firms to test how the market might react if certain things start being invested in more um, which was super useful so Mike I thought maybe you could give a closing comment before Kristen wraps up um, just on something that you think is um, a particularly you know for on a personal level Mike you've been involved in so many projects um, in so many different countries, but maybe some, choose something that you think is particularly interesting, even if it hasn't quite been proven yet for this project, um, but something that's on a personal level for you has been interesting to kind of try and work through and, ex and explore in terms of market systems. Uh, I don't know that I have just one thing. Uh, actually, maybe I'd go back to something that, uh, that uh, Claire mentioned and you talked about in terms of pharma organizations. Um, what, what we did was we created uh, a metrics or conditions, what we call self-selection. So if the, the market actor was acting in a certain way, we would continue to work with them as long as they were acting in a way that was fair, transparent, and was really driving uh, the system in a good way. And that included a whole range of initial cooperatives. Uh, in the end, almost none of the cooperatives really followed through on, the, on those behavior patterns, so we ended up not really working with them. And in the end, it's been almost all private sector firms that had uh, that have kind of moved in that way. Even social enterprises, when we started to work with them, local social enterprises often uh, fell off because they really weren't that interested in acting in a in a way that was clear, fair, and transparent. In a lot of ways, that where they were just interested in our in getting our money and and not really delivering value for for their operations. So, it, but what we have found on on the other side of that related to the how, how do farmers organize organize is that as farmers see real opportunities and as they're treated in ways that's fair and transparent, they, there's a self-organizing process that doesn't necessarily lead immediately to any cooperative that we would think about for par bargaining power. Because the nature of, of even that thinking about bargaining power assumes there's always an adversarial relationship. And as we get these larger firms in a lot of cases to see that they need to have allied relationships with the farmers, the, the need for bargaining power just to deal with adversarial expectations isn't as prevalent as the need to essentially perform in a certain way, act in a transparent way on both sides. So, I mean, this, this, I, the effectiveness of trying to understand uh, self-selection has been, I think, a, a very powerful tool because as we started this, again, there's very few businesses that were really engaged with this. And now firms do come with us 
and there's even been more, more and more recently how the firms are telling staff how great they are and how good they are at business, and this is the best project they've had that really understands and helps them move with business. There's just a whole credibility change that has uh, been substantial in the two years of this project. Great. Thank you, Mike. Over to you, Kristen. All right. Thank you both so much. This has been really interesting. Um, and as we're seeing in the poll about topics to learn more about, it looks like we have interest on some deeper dives. So we'll be sure to, to follow up on that in the coming weeks and months. Um, definitely, if you haven't voted on that yet, go ahead and please do so. Just to, to tie up a few questions that um, we thought needed more of a USAID response, particularly around um, some of the M&E things. Uh, yes, as some of you have rightly recognized, that donor approaches tend to be target-oriented, which is a bit contradictory to the good practice that Mike is finding in the field. Um, and ultimately, that comes down to many things uh, we see in development. You have to strike the right balance. Ultimately, USAID's requirement to report to Congress on certain types of things is never going to go away. Or if it does, that means our money has gone away. So if we want to continue funding things, we need to have some sort of way to aggregate and report up. But it's a matter of being able to, to balance that story that we need to tell to Congress with the types of M&E and the approaches and the targets that are more meaningful to the actual day-to-day -day project management and learning and effectiveness. Um, so it's, it's a delicate dance that we are still learning how to do. Um, but projects like Mike's and others um, are helping to, to lead the way. And I think we need to, to bear in mind that given, given as the U.S. government we have a high level of risk aversion, that it's going to take a number of test cases like ABC and others to really provide a strong proof of concept before all of our mission staff will feel comfortable doing some of these things which is part of why we encourage you that as you have interesting learning like this and, and shifts in approaches and um, figuring out how to do flexible and adaptive management, you continue to share them out. Because the more we can share that this is working in places, the more likely it will be that all of USAID staff will feel comfortable working in this modality. Um, to Lisa's question about what type of contract uh, this was, it's just a very vanilla cost plus fixed fee contract, nothing too special in there, um, but bearing in mind that we need to contract to the higher level goals and not every detail of how to get to those goals, and then have those strong relationships like Mar Margie and Mike talked about in the beginning between your contracting officer, the, the contracting officer representative, and your chief of party. And then you can really do a lot of adaptive things if there is that trust and communication. Um, one other point to note in terms of, of moving the staff uh, from the field back into DACA to, to work with some of these firms, part of this was linked to a Feed the Future zone of influence issue where it was originally interpreted to be quite rigid that only work could be done inside the zone. And if the right firms were outside of the zone, there was an issue with that. So as we go into the new evolution of Feed the Future, the interpretation of the zone of influence has changed, which will resolve this problem going forward for everyone. It's more about the zone of influence defining where we want to see impact for the beneficiaries, but you're free to work with whomever you need to, wherever they may be, in order to have that impact. Um, and we definitely have groups inside USAID that are working very hard to try to find more adaptable ways to do design, contracting, and M&E, um, trying to pilot some things, trying to, to really build the case that this should be the default way of doing business going forward. So I just wanted to reassure people that it is on our radar. We are working on it. Keep pushing learning at us to, to keep us moving forward. And I hope you all really appreciated this webinar and Mike and Margie's time, and we will bring them back to you again with some of these deeper dive topics. Uh, so stay tuned for that, and have a 